Welcome to the Kettle House. Thank you for coming to this round table for the Bonner Historical Society. Um, I just want to point out a few things before we get started. Um, so we have bathrooms. Ladies, you are back in this corner over here. Gentlemen, you are on this side. So gentlemen, ladies, um, there's some refreshments over in the corner if you want some coffee and cookies over by the front doorway. Obviously, there's the bar if you want some beer. And then there is the chameleon food truck out that door over there if you guys are a little bit hungrier than just some cookies and some stuff like that. Um, so one thing I want to point out too, so you have time, is we're going to do an intermission about halfway through this talk. So once I get back up and do my presentation again, once I'm done with the Q&A after that, we'll take a little break. So you guys can time it, or if you feel like you need to get up, don't hesitate, go up and make yourself comfortable. So welcome, welcome, and here we go. Thank you, Will. Um, thanks to Will and the Kettle House for letting us do this here. We didn't know how it was going to work, and they've welcomed us not only with welcome or open arms, but um, Will's going to be a big part of our program today, um, explaining what's what we got going on in here and relating it to the history of of the bars and the brews of Bonner. I guess is what we're calling this. Um, I'm Kim Brigham. Um, our program today, we're, we're sort of going back to our roots as a history roundtable. Um, it's going to consist of a couple of, uh, well, actually three presentations after Glenn Max Hooligan gets us going with a, an appetizing story, or an appetizer story. <laughs> And so what we're going to do is um, we, we've broken it down into the breweries, the bars, and we call it bootlegging, but the stills of these hills uh, of the Bonner area. And those are three separate segments. After each introduction, introductory segment, we're going to turn this over to you guys hoping that we stimulate some stories. That's what the, the crux of this is going to be, is an open mic um, passed around to each of you. You have the option of saying something or passing it on to the next person. But we think this, this might uh, actually return us to our roots as a, as a round table, even though we're not really around tables yet. So. Um, our programs are recorded by Missoula Community Access Television, MCAT. We've got cameras there and there. As part of a media assistance grant don donated to the Friends of Two Rivers on behalf of the Bonner Milltown History Center and Museum by MCAT. Roundtables will be aired on MCAT Channel 189 and downloaded to Channel 189 video on demand at a later date. Um, that the topic that we have here, you might keep that in mind that what you say is going to be on TV. <laughs> and so be, be a discretionary, uh, maybe not use as many names <laughs> or something as, as we um, normally would. Um, with that, I'm going to turn, uh, turn it over to, oh, one other thing. Um, will McKenzie, who will be back up here in a little bit, he mentioned that there's going to be an intermission. And we encourage you, if you plan to eat um, the chameleon 
food truck is right outside the door there. And the intermission might be a good time to place an order and then um, pick up your order when the, when the program is over or even before. We, we don't want to discourage you even right now of getting up and going or, order a beer or a drink. We've got cookies and, and et cetera. So um, we want to keep this as informal and fun as, as we can. And speaking of which, Glenn Max. All right, you guys ready? Can you hear me? All right, here's my table right over here. These guys I grew up with. Here I worked with some of you guys, you know, Bonner to me is, you know, just was a great place to be. Uh, I come out here in the early 50s. Right straight into the mic. Right straight into the mic? All right, thanks. Thanks, I appreciate that. Okay, and I'm going to be talking about a train today, so I'm glad my back is right up front here to keep me on track. Anyway, as I walked into this building the first time, I was amazed to see the old high landing over here. Had a flood of memories come back. One of them being old number 1246. Any of you guys remember that old locomotive? Okay, it was a, uh, I had to write it down here. It was a smoke belching, steam leaking, piston clanking locomotive and it pushed 12 cars right onto this landing here. <coughs> and reason for that, there's two sets of tracks there. One set of tracks closest to the river were positioned that way to let the logs roll in second. Tracks was right behind it, and that's where the jammer or river crane run, which tripped those cars and let the logs flow into the river. And you'll probably see some pictures that we have posted of logs in the river. Anyway, changes came real quick to water. Uh, you just get used to one way of life, and all of a sudden it's changed. And what happened uh, with the Milwaukee Railroad? They decided to change that old locomotive out to a, a switch diesel. And uh, when they did that, why, well, it was about the time that I uh, graduated from finding where the whiskey was stashed in the woodsheds. I don't know if you read the article I wrote about, I can't mention any names, but uh, the house number now is, uh, I think, 68. <laughs> As a kid, growing up out here, we, we found that uh, uh, the state of Montana repealed Prohibition, 1926, and which was a good thing. A lot of people like to have a little nip now and again. And I had a curiosity as a young hooligan of what does this stuff taste like? I would ask and they would say, get out of here. You're a kid. You got no business wanting to drink that stuff. And that just that just lit the fuse. It burned hotter. So I found where there was some wild turkey. And a rather unique way of uh, the couple that lived in this particular Bonner house. Uh, how they kept that a secret from each other, but yet I was able to discover it. So they left one day to chase a little dog down that had mysteriously got out of their house, run up the side of Bonner Mountain here. And while they were chasing the dog down, I slipped in, took my very first shot of wild turkey. And I have in my mind, it must be like Kool-Aid. So with the Kool-Aid thought in my mind, I tipped that bottle back and it was the closest thing to a near-death experience that I have ever had. I'm laying on my back in that woodshed, which is just littered with chips and bark, and I hear the owners of the place chasing their dog, and I thought, I've got to get out of here. 
Well, I managed to get on my feet and get the heck out of there, and uh, that's pretty much the way I wrote the story up. The next challenge to come along was beer quaffing. I wanted to find out what beer quaffing was all about. And again, I'm told, you're a kid. You're not supposed to be drinking that stuff. So I thought, kid be damned, I'm going to have me some. So word had it that when Local 3038 was to have their union picnic at Marco Flats, was all about the same time old 1246 retired. So if we go up that railroad track bed just a ways to Marco Flats, uh, the only way you can get to it now, there's a footbridge that connects it. There was a swinging bridge. It fell in years ago. Anyway, I go back to the to Marco Flats. And just like the crowd here, a lot of good people, they like their beers, and they like to socialize, and we were having a great time back there. And then, lo and behold, here comes the beer truck, Highlander Beer. I'm going to mention that name. Because a lot of people didn't like Highlander, I did. <laughs> the guy in charge of the beer truck was a big, huge, Bonner Millwright. I won't mention his name, but he was an outside Millwright, and he was big. And he was in charge of doling out the beers. Okay, I figured I can slip up in that beer truck, grab me a can of beer. I got my church key, it's in my pocket. I'll get that beer and I'm gone. I'm going to find out what this is all about. I went up there and he caught me and told me that if he caught me again, what was going to happen, and it was not going to be very pleasant. But boy, I want a taste of that Highlander in the worst way. Back in the beer truck I went. I got the beer, but also I got a huge hand right on the back of my neck and another one on my belt. And I went out the door of that beer truck like you can't believe. Hit the ground, done a roll, split. I figured, boy, any minute this big brute's going to come and just stomp me down. <laughs> well, I got away and I got back in the bushes to have my sip of Highlander. Got my church key out. There were steel cans back then. And I started to open that can, and it exploded. I mean, evidently, when I got thrown out of that beer truck now, it, <laughs> it shook that beer up pretty good. And all I had was what was on my clothing and on the leaves of the bushes around. I took a taste, thought, well, it's neat. It's different, but somehow I've got to have a better taste. What became the better taste for me later on in life was uh, if you went to Helena, there was a, a brew up there called Kessler. You guys remember Kessler? You go a little bit north and east of here was Great Falls Select, Butte Special, if you went to the mining city, let's see, what was some other ones there? Anyway, there was a variety of different beers. And that lasted me all through my working career. And what, what really gets me is I worked at this mill three years before I became of legal drinking age. <laughs> but anyway. Once I got employed at the mill, that was a 45-year stint that went by remarkably fast. And uh, when we retired, my wife and I decided, let's go to Germany. Now is a good chance to see what beer quaffing is all about. And if you've been to Germany, <laughs> there's no way you're going to taste every beer that they make. <laughs> they do a lot of it, and it's good. So, let me take a break here and catch up with my cards. Okay, after traveling around the world like I did, retired from the mill, it's time to come back. And I find out now that uh, the old water mill is going to be history. Spooked the heck out of me. 
a lot of good times out here. I didn't want to see this old place go away. So I got involved with the, the history team here and thanks to Judy Madsen and Miney Smith and Dennis and all the guys that helped put this and make this what it is we have today. You know, it's just beautiful pub, I guess would be a good name to call it. <coughs> Takes me back to when you couldn't have a beer, but now I can, and what, what a spectacular place this is to enjoy beer quaffing. Something I look forward to for a long time. Okay. Most of the little pubs that I, had, I visited while in Germany were along the Rhine River. But in the back of my mind was always the Blackfoot River. And it hit me like a ton of bricks. Here's this beautiful little beer pub right here on the banks of the Blackfoot River. And that rang a bell in my memory that's just, you know, it's irreplaceable. I am glad that I actually live to enjoy this. So, with that, that's pretty much my story on beer quaffing and alcohol. I had a hell of a curiosity. It was satisfied. And now, <laughs> it's even more glorious. So with that, I'd like to introduce uh, uh, Will McKenzie again. He's the retail manager for the Kettle House. And uh, you give you a better idea on how this all came about. Thank you. How's it going? Can everybody hear all right? It's like an ice cream cone, right? Yep. <laughs> um, my name is Will McKenzie. I'm the retail sales manager for the Kettle House. I have been doing this for seven months. This is a brand new position, so I'm figuring out as I go. Um, and one thing, when I was talking to Kim and Judy, um, they asked if we could host this session here, and I mentioned that I had graduated from the history program at the University of Montana, so they were very stoked and asked me to participate and speak, because I am a history nerd myself, which is well, pretty fun. So I'm going to start with a little background information about the Kettle House. So the Kettle House actually started um, in 1995 down at its Myrtle Street location. Does everybody know where that is? So it actually opened as a U-brew on premise. So the idea was for people to go in and brew their own beer. Wasn't the best business model, but it was kind of cool. Um, in a couple of years, they started selling growlers, but they couldn't sell pints for a profit inside the tap room. So they got together with the Montana State Legislature, and in 1999, they lobbied and were able to start selling pints like you're having now, which changed the landscape of the modern brewing industry in the, in the state. Um, and that's when they first established the 48 ounce drinking limit, which is still in an establishment today. So you can only have 48 ounces of beer at any brewery unless it has its own license um, to sell more. But that's kind of cool because they were the first, the Kettle House is the first brewery to sell a pint for profit in the state in modern times, which is pretty cool. Um, in 2006, they started canning beers at a time when it was popular to bottle beers. That was the accepted way to sell the fancy beer. Um, but the owner, Tim O'Leary, wanted to be very respectful of the environment. Um, and recycling cans was much easier to do in, in Missoula and Montana then than it was glass bottles, same as it is now. Um, and so it's just much easier on the environment to do it that way with the recycling. But then there's also the added benefit that you could actually take the cans of beer out into the wilderness with you and drink it on the river and not worry about breaking glass, which is pretty cool. So um, in 2009, to keep up with this demand of canning, they opened the north side, which is over on the tracks, right on the Orange Street underpass. You guys all know where that is? So within six months of opening that place, they realized that it wasn't enough. They couldn't keep up with the demand of canning, even then with two locations. So they began looking about how to open a new place um, because they jokingly talked about how they had the only salesman in the business that's job was to go around saying, no, you can't buy our product because we're going to keep up with it, which is pretty funny. Um, so in 2013, 
um, the owners, Tim O'Leary and Susie Riza, came out here and stood on the banks of this Blackfoot River and saw an opportunity to kind of bring the mission of the Kettle House together with their ideas for a new production facility. So the mission of the Kettle House has always been um, to match the quality of the beers with a Montana outdoor lifestyle experience, which is very easy to see as you look out these windows with you know the background that we're looking at, especially as it's snowing. So um, they broke ground and the first beer was brewed out here at this location in January of 2017. But I'm gonna back up for a second, go back to 2016 where Tim O'Leary, the founder of the Kettle House, had a lunch meeting with Nick Chakota, who is the owner of Logjam, Top Hat, and the Wilma, and they decided to build a world-class amphitheater on this site as well. And literally four days after that lunch meeting, they broke ground on this site. So fast forward a little bit until November of last year is when we first opened this tap room. Um, so we've only been open for three months here, so which is pretty cool and it's exciting to kind of see how everything's gonna come together, especially coming into the spring and summer season, um, which is pretty cool. Um, so kind of going back into the history of this site, so this used to be the site of a victory garden. Does anybody know what a victory garden is? Does anybody not know? So a victory garden were gardens that were built on private lands during the World Wars, World War I and World War II um, in an effort to help alleviate the food supply during that. Um, so they grew gardens, or they grew vegetables and herbs and all that kind of stuff, and they contributed to programs like using rationing stamps and cards to help reduce pressure on public food supply. And it was also a good way to boost morale um, because people felt like they were indirectly aiding the war effort. So you can actually see, you might have to come up after, but right here is a picture of the site we're on, which is the Victory Garden right here. And then this is the modern, where the brewery is. You can see the, you know, the going up the valley. It's kind of cool to think about. So our modern version of this Victory Garden, many of you may be aware that we actually have a solar array on the building over here. We have 189 solar panels. So we're not farming vegetables, we're farming electrons. So we're trying to contribute to the war on climate change um, like the site was contributing to the war in Europe, um, which is pretty cool. So we have 189 solar panels on the roof. Um, eventually we're actually going to have a little um, tablet in the foyer over here that measures how much electricity has been produced on site. So you can come in and grab a beer and see how much energy is being produced out here. So what's really cool about this is most of the electricity Montana gets is you know, from out of state and it's pushed in. So with electricity, as it's fed along, you lose efficiency and you lose some of it. So by having these solar panels here, it contributes directly into the system here so it's 100% efficient, so there's no energy loss. So anybody who's a Missoula Electric Co-op customer around here is most likely getting direct energy from the production on here, which is pretty cool. So it's a nice thing to do. Um, So the goal of the Kettle House is to eventually be carbon neutral, and we're taking steps like that to aiding in that way. I'm sure many of you have seen the big red um, outbuilding on the property over here. That is a wastewater treatment plant. So beer is 90% water, and when it actually is brewed, there is some wastewater that comes off that you can't actually directly put back in the water because it wouldn't be environmentally sound. So we're the only brewery in the state to have our own where we take the water from the brew process, pump it back in, filter it, and then drop it back into the aquifer. So that's not only responsible business ethics, but our number one resource is water, so we'd be doing ourselves a disfavor by giving anything but less than perfect water into the aquifer that we produce the beer with. Pretty cool. Um, so one thing that's really cool is if you see the tables and the wainscoting and the wood on the bar, all that is made from wood that has been pulled out of the river, which is really, really cool. Um, as you can see, the kind of feel we've gone for in this tap room is very much tying in the history with the wood from the river and upcycling. So we have the kind of industrial look and feel. As you can see, the keg lights, you know, these are old kegs that we can no longer use, so we repurpose them as lights. Kind of cool. 
Um, we're eventually going to have a kick rail made out of rebar that's pulled out of the river as well. So a kick rail is where you put your feet at the bar. So we don't have one now, but we're actually in the midst of pulling some out of the river and fabricating it. So kind of add to that whole feel of everything that's kind of been there. Um, so we haven't done anything outside yet. We barely have a patio, so we're very much going to work on that this spring. And the whole goal is to use native plants and shrubbery to landscape. We'll obviously have some grass, but we want low impact, low water, and that kind of stuff. So kind of keep the feel of the native Montana experience. Um, so in the goal, and Kettle House's motto, we're in search of cooler times as we fight climate change. Um, the owner of the Kettle House famously likes to say that the journey of a thousand beers starts with the first sip, and that little things add up, and that we're very excited to see how these little sips get us to that thousandth beer. <laughs> That's a whole lot of beer. Um, it's pretty cool. Um, does anybody have any questions? So one thing with the solar panels on top, if you guys are a Missoula Electric Co-op member, you can actually opt in and purchase one of the panels and you get the production of that panel for 25 years. So you basically get it as a tax, as a statement credit on your bill. So you have some solar energy. And then if you buy one, we actually give you a free beer a day for 25 years. <laughs> so if you think about it, uh, a free beer a day is going to definitely pay off in about a year. <laughs> Um, I'm going to pass the mic around if anybody has any questions. What we're going to do now is, is pass this mic around. Just pass it to the next person if you want to, don't want to say anything. Or, Mary, can we start with you? Just pass it on if you have any, any comments, stories about the blue Oh, you can do it. Hey, you know, a thousand beers is only about three beers a day for a year. Yeah. <laughs> How does one go about uh, joining that electric co-op? I can meet with you and get you that information. Yeah. It's, it's, so there's a couple different ways you can do it. Uh, the cost of one panel is $650, and then you get the energy produced off of that for 25 years. So the estimated break-even point on that with current electrical costs is about 20 years. But the real kicker is the free beer. Yeah. Uh, that's the, that. Um, but also what's really nice, too, is they have an interest-free program, so you can do six months. You can break over the, the $650 over six months, so pay like $100 eight dollars a month for six months and do the same thing. Well, for that dollar, for that six fifty, and the beer a day, maybe we should bring the Tuesday coffee, which ends at eleven thirty, and this starts at noon. Anybody else? Okay, here we go. Yeah, I was just curious who did the woodwork for the bar and the tables. Say that again. Who, sorry. who, who actually did the wood, woodwork for the bars and the tables? It was a collaboration between two companies. Um, Hellgate Forge over here on the mill site uh, fabricated, they cut the wood and then also built the metal frames. But then Price Construction, who built the tap room as well, did the finishing on the tables. Yeah, it's beautiful. So one cool thing too is we have a very large Bavarian style table on its way in. It was supposed to be here 
four months ago. <laughs> but best laid plans, um, as, you, as the saying goes. Hopefully we'll have it in about a month, but it's literally can seat 25 people. It is community style, and it's gonna be a, just a gorgeous centerpiece. And the reason we wanted to do that is because in this modern day society, people are so addicted to their cell phones. We wanted to have a way for people forced to sit together and put their phone away and get to meet their neighbors and people sitting next to them. So hopefully it works. Otherwise, I mean, I'm gonna come in here and there's gonna be 25 people on their phones and I'm just gonna walk out. <laughs> um, any other questions? Um, so we are currently looking into how to properly do that. We very much want access to the river, a walkway, down over on this side over here. Um, a couple other things we're looking into is we want to get a um, patio that overlooks this, but we want to make sure we're doing everything properly um, for the river, for the community, mitigate liability, and make sure everything's done just on the up and up. Because um, people are going to come up from the river no matter what, so we want to provide them a safe way to do so. I'm Ken Piers, in case you didn't know, but uh, I was born across the road here and I spent a lot of my time hiking and hunting all of this, so it's all familiar. As a kid, we used to uh, come down here, uh, be known to our parents, of course, and we'd walk across the river on the logs. And uh, that, was, that was kind of a, an experience of its own, but then there was a, also, a, a, I think they called it a flume or whatever, they hold the logs back. And my dad walked to work every, every day on, and a, a lot of the other guys, and they'd, they'd cross that flume and walk around the, the hill and back home. And so it, it was an, an interesting place to be around. And uh, we had a lot of fun down there, and, and we fished down there, and we swam up the, the river here. It was a b big part of our community because a lot of people enjoyed this area, so we had a lot of fun. So we thank you for building here. Of course. It uh, is uh, a real nice building, and we appreciate having it here. So the Kettle House has always been stewards of both the environment and the community. Um, one of the reasons, they, besides production, they built the Northside Tap Room is because they have a community. We, ha we hold a community unite. It's a pint night where we donate a dollar of every beer sold to a community or a community event or a non-for-profit of choice. And it's ever popular and it just keeps growing. Um, so we very much want to be participatory with the community that we're in, why we're hosting you guys, because it's nice to have everybody out here, but also do the right thing by the environment as much as we can as well. Okay, I'd like to add, <clears throat> I mentioned it. My wife and I had traveled Germany and then uh, Will mentioned a big Bavarian type table that they're going to have. Uh, while I was in Germany at an Oktoberfest, they served the brews in two liter mugs. The first one I drank was kind of limbered me up. <laughs> By the second brew, I was locked arms with people on each side of me singing in their native language and understanding every word that I sang. <laughs> so that was my, my experience. My wife kind of looks pained at that, but what a great night that was. Other story? Okay, Kim. So, one thing I guess we didn't properly introduce Will, did we? <laughs> did you? Oh, okay, okay, sorry about that. Um, this it was the point in our program that we were going to take a little intermission. And if I think this is as good a time as any, this is where you can, you know, feel free to get up and move around and order a beer. Or, um, like I say, it, if you want to eat here, the the uh, 
chameleon truck has really good food and it would be a good time to order it now so it will be ready when the program is over or, or even before. Uh, you're right, those green menus on the table, maybe we, those of you who aren't at a table could, uh, or those who are can share with those who aren't if they want to. Um, so we're, we tried this last year and it worked okay, a uh, 10 minutes kind of break. And uh, we will try to herd everybody back in, the, in, at, in about 10 minutes. So I, I've got, what, 236 right now. So somewhere around 245 we'll, we'll reconvene, talk about bars and stills. So we're going to sw swing into the second segment, um, the bar segment. And my idea is to take a quick trip um, bar hopping through the Bonner School District, basically, over the years. Um, and it's not only to tell you what I think I know, but I'm hoping that you will correct and add anything you've got um, that, that you hear. In the back and on the side, we've got some photos of old bars in uh, most of them in Milltown I think um, what we'd like you to do is if there's some things you notice or you know the location the exact location of those places we'd like to get that on record and so if you could maybe if uh, I think there's pens available at the back table oh by the posters okay Oh, we're talking these posters over here to, and in the back by the door, etc. So um, Midway Bar, etc. Um, e even if you just want to put your phone number down, and uh, we can get hold of you and, and uh, learn what you know. So here's what I know: um, if we pull out of the driveway here, out to Highway 200, and take a left, we're going to go start our bar hopping tour um, at the Blackfoot Tavern, which is, what, two miles up, up the river. Um, all kinds of stories about the Blackfoot Tavern. Um, we could go all the way up to, uh, to Roundup Bar, etc., but that's a little too far for, our, for today. And so we're going to stop at the Whispering Pines Pavilion, which is one of the unknown bars of, of Bonner. It was a Prohibition Bar, 1931-1932, only lasted a couple of years. And um, it's, it was located um, on this side of Wishard Bridge. Wish, Wishard Bridge is the first crossing of the highway of the Blackfoot River, maybe four or five miles up the river. And um, at that time it was called the Third Red Bridge. You guys, some of you know more about the Red Bridge count than I do, but the Third Red Bridge at that time is where the Whispering Pines was. I apologize for the handwriting here, by the way. This is why I'm not a teacher anymore. Um, let's come back down the highway and enter Bonner, um, where the post office and, and the history center is now. That building used to be the roundhouse for the streetcar from 1910 to 1932. In subsequent years, it became, um, among other things, Bill's Roundhouse. Now, there's some question whether that was would be classified as a bar or not. Does anybody know? Does that be a bar? It was a bar. Yeah. It, w it was a bar. Yeah. Okay. Okay. They sold beer. Well, well, that's our. <laughs> That's our chief criterion. <laughs> um, although we, we will bypass a few places that sold beer, sell beer, and, but wouldn't be classified as a bar, saloon, tavern, that kind of thing. Um, across the street then from Bill's Roundhouse um, was probably the oldest liquor license in Bonner, the Margaret Hotel, where the, the park is now. Um, on your on your right as you're going through Bonner, that's that was the site of the Margaret Hotel, 1892 to 1957. Um, 
keep on going through Bonner, and on your left where the baseball field is, Kelly Pine Field, used to be, before the streetcar came in, something called the Bonner House. It was a tavern, a bar, and the stage station before the streetcar came in. Okay, continue on past the school, past the churches, around the corner to Milltown. Uh, let's park in the, uh, the parking lot of the store, Disbro's, River City Market, um, all the names that are now, it's now, um, a, what, Lennox Cabinetry Shop? Behind that, as we look at it in modern day, was Mills Midway Bar started out the Midway Bar um, and in the 19, I think 1939 and um, later Mel Lang took it over and it, it stood until well into the 70s if, I, if I'm not mistaken. It's now, uh, it, it, it's been various things since then. Um, on the other side of, I'm going to call it Disbro's, the market, um, where a refrigeration company is now. <laughs> People can tell me what that, what that, the name of it is if you have it. But um, a at that location was the original, well, it was Dahlberg's Pool Hall. It burned down in 1932, um, which means at the end of Prohibition, near the end of Prohibition, um, and that was what they called bars back then were pool halls. Uh, one of the things they called them in 19 in <laughs> Prohibition. Um, but it was a it was a I guess a, a community center at the time. Um, they had movies, showed movies upstairs, Rene Levesque's barber shop, and uh, and things like that. It burned down in 1932. A couple of if I get my months correct, it was a week after the Lutheran bo ch uh, church burned down in 1932, and it was a couple of weeks be or a couple months before the Whispering Pines burned down in 1932. That was a big year, and of course that was the end of Prohibition. There may have been some connections there. I don't know. Excuse me, were those fires oh. arson or anything? Um, for some reason, the Missoulian didn't say that, say what they were caused. <laughs> um, it, it could have been. The, yeah, exactly, and there may have been a connection, I don't know. Dahlberg's Pool Hall was, later became Weimer's Garage and Dave Otto's store. Um, at this time, the streetcar station at Milltown was right behind Dahlberg's when the street, the main street or the main highway from Missoula came across what we now call the Old Black Bridge. And so the store and the, the saloon and everything was oriented that direction. Now that's kind of the back street. And the streetcar is, streetcar line was where the highway is now, the Highway 200. So we crossed the highway to the Riverside Saloon, the, fir the first uh, almost immediately to your right. Do I have, do I have that right? No. Nope, I don't. Ed's bar. It was what? Ed's Bar. Ed's Bar. Ed Swanson's Bar. Oh, oh, there was an Ed Swanson's Bar there too. Yeah. I'm glad. I'm. That's what we're here for. Yeah, the Riverside After same building or? Yeah. Okay. On Second Street? No, 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 no. We're talking still in Milltown. Oh, oh, okay. Okay, yeah. Yeah, this is all Milltown. Yeah, so so we're crossing from Disbro's towards the tracks, but we aren't to the tracks yet, and we have R Riverside Saloon, very um, iconic until it disappeared. I don't know how, I don't know its history too well. Cross the tracks, and of course we have Herald's Club was the first one on the right, it's now the Moose Club, but it had a it had a great history and still has a great history to it. And one of the few on this list that are still standing and operating as um, some sort of a bar. 
Next to it, though, we had Scandinavians. We had the, what, Norwegians, maybe? <laughs> I don't know. Um, there were three bars, bing, 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 according to um, my sources, which generally are the grassroots. There's a book here I meant to have. This is where I get all my expertise, uh, the Bible of Bonner, um, the story of Bonner, Montana, for sale at River City Grill or Bonner School for $20 if anybody <laughs> wants one. Um, so we have the Scandinavian, we have the Atlantic, the San Facon, which may have been the same as one of these two over time, because we're talking the period of 1890s all the way to now that these were these weren't all here at the same time obviously so and you guys probably can't even see this list over there can you <laughs> um, and the pool hall it was interesting that Mildred Dufresne who wrote the chapter on Milltown she identified another pool hall during prohibition um, which is a kind of across the street on the first block if you turn left from Harold's Club and it was the third house in, she said, and, and it, uh, they just called it the pool, ho pool hall. So we're leaving Milltown. We're going to skip across the river. We're almost there to West Riverside. And I just learned about this uh, a couple of days ago. Swanson's Bar. Um, as you, when you turn at the light by Town Pump now, and turn right and go down what becomes First Street of West Riverside. Get to the stop sign, the four-way stop, and let me know if I'm not getting this right. You turn, you turn right there for just a half a block, and the building that was Ed Swanson's bar is still a house there along, a, along. West, West, the corner of West Riverside and, and 2nd Street. Yep. Um, I wasn't sure whether to, con whether to include the Finn Hall on, on this list because it wasn't really a bar, but it had a liquor license. Finn Hall started its days basically where the I-90 interchange at Bonner is now. They moved it in, uh, I think, 1911 over to Fourth Street on in West Riverside because they were building the Western Lumber Com Company Mill, W.A. Clark's Mill. And so now it's, it's still there. Um, a lot of you have a lot of memories, I think, even if you're not finished, of Finn Hall. Um, and these days it's a, what, a feed storehouse? Feed, feed where? Dog food. Dog food, yeah, dog food, uh, pet food warehouse. Um, those are the only two I'm aware of that were in what we call West Riverside uh, in that area. If we continue on down Highway 200 now to what, what we refer to as Pine Grove, um, the, the, probably the most memorable one is the Club Chateau, um, which started out as Richie Fontaine, the boxer's training building, and when he pretty much ended uh, near the end of his career, he and I think a brother started the ring club that became Richie's club. This is in the 1940s, and um, pretty soon in the early 50s, the Marshaldons bought it and turned it into what became the Club Chateau. Interestingly enough, the first reference I found to it was, it was called the Chateau Distinctive, which I think they really wanted to draw the line between Richie's Ring Club and uh, a supper house that, that the Club Chateau became. Um, I, I left one out, out off here, maybe the most interesting one. There was a speakeasy a block, about a block behind the Club Chateau in, in Pine Grove that was called the Blue Moon. And I found reference to it in Old Missoulians. It was an open-air dance pavilion um, that was 
near what became the Nyquist House residence back there. There are to this day some some really cool old looking buildings back in that area. Um, if you just take a look around and sometimes I wonder if one of them wasn't the original Blue Moon Speakeasy. Lasted from 1928 till the feds busted it in 1929. <laughs> and it, it's interesting that um, one of its ads in the paper said and this was during prohibition and it said uh, free but free beer outside of hall so I, I'm not sure what that meant <laughs> to the west the Missoula side of the club chateau this is according to the account in our book here by Nancy Fontaine um, was the the Grizzly Inn. This came in after Prohibition, so it seemed legit, um, 1928 to 1929. Um, and it was a, uh, yeah, well, that's, that's probably enough. So that's our tour, that's our bar hopping tour. I hope that, and we could have gone back up the Clark Fork to to the Tura Pines, et cetera, but I, I wanted to keep this in basically the Bonner School District. So what I'm hoping now is that this reminds you, this list reminds you of something, and when, when we, we can start passing the microphone around and, and hear some old bar stories, again, reminding that this is on TV. <laughs> Hal, do you want to start? Well, I had a pretty good connection with Swanson's Bar because I used to go down and Ed had hired me out to throw planer blocks in his, his old woodshed back there and he'd give you 10, 20 cents when you were done and everything. But my most memorable one is, of course, in 1979, Denny Ruan and I were uh, riding horses full gallop down West Riverside Drive and uh, old Dick, the horse I was riding on, he decided to go right and I went straight. And uh, when I gathered myself all up, my wrist looked really bad and so I started walking home and Ed was sitting out in front of the bar and he said, uh, Ken, he said, you all right? And I said, no, I think I broke my arm. He said, well, you better get in my car, I'll take you home. So <laughs> we got that taken care of, but he was a good old boy. Yeah, I think you missed one up there t on the Blackfoot. There was one right there uh, to the left after you crossed McLemire's Bridge. It was built across the creek. And the name of the creek that comes down through Potomac, uh, I can't remember the name of it now. Union Creek. Union Creek. Okay, there was two great big large logs that they laid across the creek, leveled off the top, and they built this bar right over the top of the logs. I remember going up there one time on a fishing trip with my uncle, and my dad was going up the Blackfoot to go fishing, and they stopped in there and got a gallon of beer. And what... What I remember after walking in there was all of the chairs made like snowshoes, all of the seats that made out of willows, and the back and the seats was all, all strung with rawhide. But it was right there at the mouth, right at the mouth of Union Creek, right there by the, the old Betches place. And, and you don't remember what it was called? The the name of the bar? I can't remember the name of the... No, I can't. I've been trying to think of the name of the the man that had it. Bill... Uh, Bob Hall up at Potomac told me what his name was, too. 
Mm -hmm. But I can't remember it now. Okay. Well, let's give it a name. <laughs> I need to add it to my list here. <laughs> so uh, we don't, we don't want to get into the Union Club or anything like that. Because Union Creek Bar. Okay. That'll, that'll remind us of that. And, of course, right on the hill above there now is, is the Steel Toe Distillery, correct? The, Union, Union Creek Bar. Okay, who else? Willie, do you want to hand that to that table back there? Because they've got stories galore. <laughs> Here, Glenn. Take the mic. A little bar that uh, is known only to the folks at this table right here. <laughs> no, I won't. I won't go into details. It was called Wood Shopper's Cabin, <laughs> and what we discovered at Wood Shopper's Cabin about beer would just blow your mind. <laughs> so with that. You know, I don't want to mention any names or embarrass anybody, so uh, I'll pass it on. But we can't forget Wood Chopper's Cabin. Does it go up the Blackfoot? In the Blackfoot? Goes in the Blackfoot category then. Yeah, it's in the, it's in the Blackfoot, and uh, it's located right at the head of uh, Johnson Creek and at the base of Sheep Mountain. Where's Dana? <laughs> You gotta be part of this too, Dana. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anybody else got a, a little hideaway they want to talk about? Maybe, maybe you guys just could pass it down the road. The still the The stills are our next segment. So hold on to that one. Um. Certainly, Mills, Midway, the Club Chateau, um, Harold's Club, certainly there are stories that can be told in a mixed crowd. Um, <coughs> Got anything, Tard? Was the only one that I can, I'm Mary Ann Buckhouse, okay. and the only one that I can uh, remember a lot of, I started for working for the Anaconda Company in 1956, and I know Anaconda had a lot of company parties at the Club Chateau. That was kind of Anaconda's headquarters there for uh, honoring people that, you know, for five, ten years of, of service or 50 years or whatever. And uh, it was a very popular supper club, I guess you would call it. And I remember having many, many uh, Christmas parties and, and company parties at the Club Chateau. And it was a very nice facility at, at that time. The others, I guess that, that must have been before my time. <laughs> Thank you. Jerry? Uh, I'm Jerry Buckhouse. Uh, not to be outdone by my, my, my wife, I got a little story about the Herald's Club. On the side of Herald's Club, my folks had uh, Harold build a, a, a little cafe. And they ran that cafe we moved to Milltown in 43, and uh, one thing about that cafe, he had a cut a hole through the wall into the bar, and uh, he liked to have a drink once in a while. This is my dad, George Buckhouse, and <clears throat> he'd just ring a little bell, and they'd set a double shot up on the, that little hole, <clears throat> and 
he had his little nip in the afternoon. And that was my place to eat. I had to have breakfast, lunch, and dinner at that cafe. So that's my story about Harold's Club. Can I connect George Buckhouse and Clara Buckhouse to George's Cafe here in Bonner where the post office, that was yeah, after, yes, they, after Milltown. After they left Milltown, they, uh, Disbro's had a grocery store and they had a little fountain on the side of the grocery store and they decided to uh, shut down the grocery store so my folks took over that part of the building the end of it was the post office <coughs> so they ran a restaurant there for a few years and and uh, that's where the Lions Club got started was that little uh, fountain on the side of the cafe they had uh, Lions Club uh, Hellgate Lions Club had their breakfast there whenever they'd be. Well, a little history about that place. Those of us who went to Bonner School remember walking down to George's Cafe after the, after the basketball games at night. Uh, I, I got a little story here that uh, about Mel's Midway. Uh, logging foreman uh, that was his pretty much hangout. And most of the crew moved in there and one of his statements he said, if I had half the logs that were cut, skidded and hauled, he said, I'd be the biggest logger in the state of Montana. He said, there's more timber cut and hauled in that bar than has ever hit the ground. <laughs> Anybody? Being just a young buck here for uh, working at the mill right out of high school, uh, starting in 75, we had a whole hour of lunch there, uh, got time to kill that on pulling on the dry chain. So uh, Blackfoot Tavern uh, was a good place to go. And they had the best burgers and got in a little dancing and everything and made it back to work after a beer or two. But uh, the go-to place usually was the Midway Tavern, Mills Tavern. And then if we had extra money, I think we'd go to Harold's Club. But uh, anybody remember the uh, motto that was on uh, the T-shirts of Mills Tavern? The Mill Tavern uh, motto? <laughs> remember uh, Bud Moore, my neighbor, would roll his own cigarettes and be smoking them and the ashes would come down and see the holes in the shirt all the time. And uh, but, uh, the, ta the, the motto was... Uh, Mills Tavern, uh, best damn flies in town. Best, best damn flies in town. Yep. And then the Club Chateau, uh, um, actually, uh, after starting the mill, mill at 75, uh, got married in 76, and my wife here and I had our uh, uh, reception dinner for before our wedding. <laughs> it was a great place to have parties. Good time. Thank you. I got a question on that Dahlberg's bar. It, is, is that any relation to the Dahlberg in Missoula? I, I really don't know. You know, because they named that field after Dahlberg in Missoula, and I, know, I think he was a World War I hero or something, and I just wonder if that family had any relation there. The, the the Butte Dahlberg, Sweet Dahlberg, etc. Yeah. And and Jigs Jigs Dahlberg was was a basketball coach and oh, and football coach at the university. I it very well could have been, but uh, I know the Dahlbergs came from Butte, and so don't know his last. And and now I'm guess has anybody heard this? I'm not sure it wasn't Dahl Grun. Does that ring a bell to anybody? A, as a Bonner name. <laughs> Dahl Grun, instead, instead of Dahl Berg, Dahl Grun. I might have written that down wrong. But. There was a Dahl Grun that had an upholstery uh, shop down on uh, Roman Street at one time. He did our old Moskies. So that was a Dahl Grun. Dahl Grun. Yeah. Dahl Berg. Yeah. I think that was Dahl Grun. 
Yeah, it, I th I'm almost thinking it was Dahlgren, but um, that would require more research than I did. <laughs> Anybody else? Um, the mic's coming around in the bar. All right, well, that's, um, that's a wrap for the bars. Um, does anybody have an update on the score? 27-10. 27 to 17. Saints. <laughs> we have a new, an, an old New Orleans boy here running the sound system, so. Uh, <laughs> All right, I'm gonna turn this over. I think that's next, right? I mean, I don't have anything else to do here. Well, they talked me into giving a little uh, working in the woods like I have. Uh, we have uncovered moonshine stills here and there throughout the country, and uh, lately they've wanted to know where they were, so. I have come up with a map of showing three of them that I know about right in the Blackfoot. It's not, not a very far trip. Because <clears throat> these stills, uh, you know, when Prohibition hit, it was a depression. And we had all kinds of people out of work. <coughs> and I haven't, uh, these, I don't know who built these stills, but I haven't, it's, it's logger ingenuity, I think. Some of these old loggers that were laid off they knew where all the little springs were because they had logged up there. So they moved out in the woods. A lot of them has moved out and built a cabin. So the moonshine stills were a natural income for these for these loggers. And uh, up the Blackfoot here, uh, of this map, uh, we have one real big moonshine still that was in what are called whiskey draw. And I had the map printed, but they, they cut me off. It's right about here, just off the corner of my map. It, it was huge. It had a huge wooden hopper, about seven feet tall and uh, about seven feet wide. Looked like a coal hopper that they must have put their grain into. And when we logged in and around there, the skid cats are building skid drill. They dug up 55 gallon barrels of liquid these are steel drums, and nobody wanted to take a, a sample of, of coming out of a steel drum. If they'd have been oak barrels. It might have been tried, but they punched holes in and let them drain. But these barrels were all full of some kind of liquid. And then uh, my partner, we were building road up here in the 80s, and uh, we found a moonshine still. And these are the pieces that we, I brought home out of that moonshine cell, that little blue cooker that uh, Ed has the other half of the cooker. He took half, I took half. And uh, it was just about 50 feet above where we were building the road, a little spring crossed there. And we took a bunch. Uh, I been took my son back to it a couple of times. We've hunted through there. And then I was told of another still just about a quarter of a mile away down in the draw at East Twin. Uh, and my son, we were hunting on the day we thought, well, let's go see if we can find it. So we hiked down the draw and we found the remains of a cabin. But it was getting late in the day and we thought, we'd better get out. And this old road here that we're walking out it is so much downfall on it that we had to crawl underneath some of the logs. To get. So I have never been back to double check, see if I can find more of it. But another little piece of history here is I have this bottle. This is homemade moonshine. My dad, back in the 30s, he had a still back in the back of the chicken house. <laughs> and so he made this, this is the last bottle of, of whatever he made. Uh, some people have sampled it off and on, but I don't give any more samples of it. it. He put the charcoal in the bottom of the bottle to filter the stuff. People have sampled it, it's not bad, but I, 
It, it's homemade moonshine. And then this crock jug here, uh, this moonshine still that Ed and I found, back down the canyon, about a mile below back in here, uh, the company had a salvage logger working in there one winter back in the 60s. And they told me, keep him plowed out. So I plowed out, well he wanted me to build him a little landing. So I graded all that out, dug that all up, built a landing. And he landed, and well, the next summer they said, go up and clean that up. So I went up with a grader to clean that up. What did I find? Probably about 25 of these all broken to pieces that I dug out that winter. It, <laughs> uh, we assumed it was a cache. It, it was about a mile away from the still, so you could brew, brew your stuff, haul it down the someplace and hide it. So if revenueers or whatever were looking for you, they found your stash, but they didn't find your still. So we assume that I couldn't believe how much of them crock jugs I broke up that I, in the snow, I didn't even know what I was digging up till the next spring and they, they were scattered all over there. And then this is East Twin Road. You go up here about two miles, you can walk, there's a road up here now you can walk all the way into that one. It's about a two mile walk there. Once you get up on the road, it's a level walk pretty much. The company kept pretty good grades on their roads. And like I say, this is part of the moonshine still that we dug up. This is, uh, we're not certain how it went together, but that's the, kind of the cooker part. And this looks like the fuel reservoir that they used, it was underneath that. And I did take the name tag. It is New Perfection Number Two, is what this was. <laughs> but I did find right beside all this was this little porcelain cup. I'm certain this was a sample cup, so they knew what they were brewing. <laughs> oh, it's. There's probably more. I've heard of another still yesterday up in Marshall Canyon, but I don't know where that was. Uh, somebody was telling me about it yesterday that I don't know, and I've heard of some up the rattlesnake, but uh, I've, I've never found them. But these here are all, this is a long walk, because you've got to go, the road's gated here, and you've got to follow the road all the way around, and probably about three, four miles. You get back to this one, but it's pretty visible. It's right below the road. And you walk around the road there and you look down, and there it is, sits. That big hopper sits there. I don't know if it's in good shape anymore or not, but it, because that road was built in the early 60s. So, but this one you can still get to. And this one, if you want to hike up and climb down in there and climb back out, there might be more there. I'd like to get back in there, but. That trip out was enough to keep me from going back. <laughs> Outside of Kim. Kim. Can you tell us where Whiskey Gulch was? I mean, for us, we don't know where. <sighs> All right. This would be John's Road Park down here. And this is what they call the McNamara Road. And you go up, and this would be what they call Old Horse Logging Camp was called Sheep Flats, and it's kind of used as a campground now. And one time they had a swinging bridge across the river. So if a guy crossed the river right there, just a short walk up Whiskey Gulch, it's, it comes right down and it kind of disappears before it goes into the river, into the ground. It, it's, if a guy wants to walk across there, it's, it's not that long a walk, because this is only, I think, two, about three or four miles from John's Root Park to this campsite is, and a guy can cross the river there where they had the swinging bridge. Is that close to Montreux? No, no. To, uh, this, this is, yeah. Uh, on uh, the, off, the end of the map right here, about here's Thibodeau Falls. Because you're, the, I guess that the mileage uh, 
I think it's about the three or four mile mark. It, I think the state has it as a campground or recreation area now. It was an old horse logging camp in the 1890s. Any questions? Way back, way back. Somebody. Dennis. Yes. When you discovered those 25 broken, how did your heart feel? I thought, there's a piece of history that I destroyed that I didn't even know was there because working like I did in the woods, if you go into the Bonner History Center, that old rusty scrap iron stuff that I picked up in my jobs around the woods. So had I found whole pieces there, I would have brought them in. Hey, Dennis, I got a story just off of the river, right past what we were calling the Third Red Bridge up there on, on the right side of the river, across the river as you cross the bridge, cross the river. That's where uh, they got a swinging rope now and they yeah. swim a lot. Just up from there a little bit, there's a little flat, a small little flat in there and a draw that goes up it and supposedly there was a still many years ago there. Uh, my grandpa always told me that and the revenues came in and busted it up and then about a week or two weeks later he took the horse team up there and a some sort of a little wagon or a skid and brought out everything he could scavenge that he thought might be useful for anything because back then you didn't waste anything so that's another spot there and if Carla's still around here she can tell you about the one up Marshall yeah she mentioned that to me yesterday because yesterday was her 65th birthday a little bitty Carla and you can't believe 65 now Carla Green There's our birthday lady standing right there. Hi, I'm Carla Green. <laughs> Who said that? Uh, my parents had Marshall Ski Area for 26 years, and a lot of you folks that have talked, uh, I was pretty young. Um, they had me older in life, so, but I, I do remember a lot of, uh, a lot of the names that have been mentioned today and are part of my legend memory bank. And um, yes, there is a still up, up um, Marshall Canyon. My, my parents bought Marshall Ski Area in 1957. And they'd heard about a still that Ole Olson, who bought, who built uh, the, both the lodge at Marshall and the home at Marshall, the log cabin. He was a Norwegian shipbuilder. And he also built up in the woods. You, you do a pretty steep climb about halfway up to the ridge right up above Marshall over up the canyon one draw. And mm, after several weeks of trying to find this place, my mom and her friend came across it and they, it was secured snug enough that when they opened the door, the, the smell was uh, just about blew them back out the door again. And uh, I grew up going visiting it occasionally and, and over the years the ceiling was sagging but the bed was still there and the, and the still was, was still, uh, still there. And uh, just a table and a bed a table where the still sat in a bed. And uh, then just, I would say, I, if anybody's interested, I could take you to the spot now. Um, but I would imagine there's just a few logs there, but I think I could still find it. So if anybody wants to go, we could set up a little, a little sojourn next summer. Yeah, everybody sees these moonshine stills on TV and everything. They're a huge contraption and huge boilers. And you look at these little pieces that Ed and I found, and they had just a small 
little cooker for processing their their grain or whatever they use to make their moonshine with so it didn't didn't need a huge huge whiskey draw was an exception as I say it was it was a huge operation unfortunately in their skidding right there they destroyed most of it just having fun mostly I'm going to see if Willie will tell us some, some of his still stories. Get a, tell us some of the stories about stills you've heard of when you were a kid. <laughs> I figured you was going to ask that. Well, about the first, well, actually the first place I remember living was out on the big flat about 1933. Uh, just, well, it'll be a few days now and I'll be 90. So anyway, there was about three or four stills out there. And this one, I can, well, I can mention the name now. They're all gone. <laughs> <laughs> but a guy by the name of Louis Martin had a still out there. And he owned this little car they called a whip -it. Red Whippet. Well, the feds got on to him. They could never find his still, but he'd come out, he'd make a run into Missoula, and the feds would be waiting for him up on the top of Blue Mountain Road. Well, they'd stop him, they'd check the car out, take the seats out, uh, also the spare tire, take that out could never find him with any whiskey. Well, they'd let him go, and he'd come into Missoula. Of course, they'd put a tail on him. And he had some friends up on the north side. Well, he'd pull in there, park out front, and the feds, they'd have a car parked down below watching him. Well, about an hour, an hour and a half go by, and it started getting dark. They'd give it up on him. Well, after dark, they'd open up the garage door of his friend's house there and run the, run the little whippet in there. And everything was all clear. The feds were gone and everything. So they'd jack the car up, drain the radiator and block. <laughs> Anyway, they said that Louie had the cleanest block and radiator in Missoula. <laughs> That's where he was hauling his booze. <laughs> but these old steel sites, of course, I don't know anything about them around here in this district, but I was <laughs> lived up at Tura most all my life. And uh, there was one up there at the Forks of Tura Creek. And I found the remains of one up there at Bowers Dump. And on east of there, across the river at uh, Bearmouth, or up, up at Beaver Tail Hill, on a ranch, there was one over there. Anytime you find an old cabin that's pretty well rotted down now, and you look around and you find the remains of a barrel all rotted away, and you know, a few bottles that have turned all purple, well, you can just well bet there had been a still there at one time. So that's all I got. I've got a little story, if you don't mind. Yep, go it, for it. Uh, my dad was born and raised at Clinton, and they, we had a, they had a ranch just on, on this end of Clinton. And uh, he knew this old bootlegger, and, and uh, he'd got a, all his booze was ready, and he said, I got a bottle of all this. And he said, Harold, why don't you come down and give me a hand? He said, so dad went down there, and he said, they, they filled all these bottles, and he said, if there was too much to seal them up, he said they'd drink the top off of them. And uh, 
he said everything was going pretty well and he pretty soon he said well I got to get home and he was about a mile away from home and he, he said I got up and he said all I could do is walk backwards <laughs> and he was out in the trees so he said I crawled on my hands and knees till I got to the road again and he said I walked all the way home one mile backwards <laughs> Had a good time. <laughs> Anybody else got one that comes to mind? I got one I'd like to share. Okay, I've had a fascination with uh, revenuers, moonshiners, and whatnot for years. <coughs> And I tried, and I wished while I was trying I would have recorded them. But I knew an old fellow that had a still up there in a ghost town. We go up there once in a while, close to that ghost town, to the dinner bell. And we have a real nice dinner up there. Anyway, this old fellow had a still up there. And I got to quiz him on how he could transport his product around the country without getting caught and he told me stories I could be here all afternoon telling what he told me but the one that I really liked was what he told me about selling his product at Saturday night dances Drummond, Helmsville, Ovando and uh, Sealy Lake so I asked him I says how could you have such a distribution area so big, but yet not get caught. And he told me that when you sell moonshine, you go to the dance hall and you look for people who have a red mark on the bridge of their nose. And I thought, well, here comes a good story. Well, come to find out, he sold his product in quart jars. And as the party got lively, and they tipped their jar up, they banged the bridge of their nose, leaving this red mark. So when you found a red nose, <laughs> you knew that it wasn't a, it wasn't a fed. <laughs> That's just one of countless stories this man told me, but I wish I had recorded them. Well, I have one more on uh, the Midway. Back in the 70s, uh, you know, the big big scene in the 70s was streaking, and we had one of our guys, he was a choker setter. He'd been in the Midway for a while, and he went out the back door, and about 10 minutes later, he comes streaking through the bar, disturbing everybody in the bar, hooping and hollering. <laughs> Ed, it wasn't Ed. <laughs> Uh, he's still around because I won't use his name right now. <laughs> Outside of that, I, that's about all I have. Um, so I'm wrapping it up, I guess. <laughs> um, I don't know about you, but this place is only two months old and it, it feels like home to me. <laughs> and like a lot of the old bars and places in Bonner, this, 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 still, this already feels like home. Um, we are the Bonner Milltown History Center and Museum, stationed at the old George, George's Cafe, which um, is open and I wish I could could remember the no, the hours, but uh, Tuesday, morning, Tuesday morning, Wednesday, Thursday afternoon. Wednesday and Thursday afternoon. You ought to see this place. I haven't had much to do with it, but Judy and Dan, I mean, we they got tons of stuff in there um, related to the logging industry in Bonner, but also a lot of other things. Um, we have these round tables on the third Sunday of January, February, and March every year. This is the 11th year that these things have been going on. 
we're trying a few things different this year. Um, one is the is the location. Usually we've been at the St. Anne Catholic Church in Bonner. Our next program is scheduled for the third Sunday of February, which is February 20th, when football season is over. Um, the Rams just tied it 20 to 20 in the fourth quarter. <laughs> the Patriots and Chiefs are on at 4.30. Um, but on February 20th, I'm sorry, February 17th, Sunday, um, we're going to have, um, what would we call it? A we, we, we Love History Party. And it's, it's not going to be a formal presentation like this. Um, I, I think it'll be more of a mix and mingle, similar to the old, old timers days that, we'd, that used to be at, at Bonner School. Now, we've got a great, great location for that, and that's the old Hellgate Lions barn um, that Friends of Two Rivers now are managing. There is the possibility in talking with Will to return that to here on February 17th. And I don't know if you guys have any preferences but we will, we're at our next meeting, we will discuss that and, and let people know. But um, uh, this, this just feels like a good location. The barn is a great location as well. It's got that huge picture, basically, that shows the, the, um, the log and train, or log, yeah, the train dumping where it dumped its logs, right off that flap. What would you call it? What do you call it? The high. The high landing, yeah, um, for so many years, and that's all the way across the back of the barn. I mean, it's, it's a great location. This is e an equally great location, so um, we'll, it'll, it'll be up in the air until we get feedback from you guys and uh, <laughs> decide, and then the advertising will go out as to the exact location, two to four. Um, this place is open till 8 o'clock. And we encourage you to stick around now. This is different than the church. <laughs> <laughs> and and the, chameleon, the chameleon is open and, again, has great food, uh, lots, of, lots of good beer to try. So we appreciate this worked out a lot better than I guess I had thought here. And uh, it's due to Will McKenzie and the whole Kettle House crew, um, that this they've been so good to us. So, um, see you in, in February. Thanks.